So there's three speeches that he gave in different places that are absolutely some of the best information. Everybody needs to read that today because what he talked about is what got us into this situation. But in a 2003 Caltech lecture, he said, scientific consensus is the refuge of scoundrels. It's a way to avoid debate when you know that your position is untenable. It's politics. It's not science. There is no consensus in science. He said the greatest scientists are great because they broke with the consensus. And you can think about it. Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler. What was the consensus back then? The sun rotated around the earth, right? Galileo got dragged before the Inquisition. And he had to recant to keep his head on his shoulders. Mendel, genetics, he was proven. Einstein, theory of relativity, when he published it in 1915, a hundred scientists, established scientists, got together and did a book to refute the theory of relativity. Einstein said, well, if they're right, we would only take one of them. We would take a hundred of them. And yet, consensus is all we hear, 97%. In the last two years, a study from Cornell and one from, I think, Yale said 100% consensus of scientists that we're the primary cause of global warming. It's all a lie, folks. About that consensus, 1998, over 31,000 scientists, a third of them were PhDs, signed a declaration that man is not the chief cause of global warming. Okay? And warming will not be disastrous, it will actually be beneficial. Do you know that in the last 20 years, 200,000 acres of the Sahara Desert have green because of the extra CO2 that's in the atmosphere? It's a plant food. Uh, just last month, 1,600 scientists signed something called the World Climate Declaration, I think. Uh, two of them were Nobel Prize winners in physics. And they said, no, there is no climate emergency, and we oppose a net zero is harmful to the environment and to world economies. There is no consensus. The only ones you hear about are the ones that the politicians and the media are, are saying what the scientists said. And the scientists are cowed down because they don't want to lose their funding, they don't want to lose their position. All right, let's say I'm lying. Let's say this is all a lie. Well, people don't lie just to keep in practice, unless you're a career politician. I hope nobody's a career politician in here. Uh, uh, who benefits from a lie? Well, usually you tell a lie to keep people finding out something that you did that you shouldn't have done, or you lie in order to achieve something that you can't get in an honest way. Okay? The scientists we've already talked about, they know where their funding comes from. They're not going to buck this narrative. They'll lose their funding, they'll lose their position. Okay. The media, advertising revenues, anything controversial, they're going to print. Universities, they know that most of the private foundations have a distinctive left-leaning bent, and they know they better uh, count out of their sensibilities if they want to put their endowments coming. But how about this? Green companies, a lot of green companies popping up everywhere. Al Gore negotiated the Kyoto Treaty for the United States. He's instrumental in setting up what they call uh, call it cap and trade, but there are limits to how much each nation can emit as far as greenhouse gases go, right? Well, the carbon offsets market is estimated to be worth $3 trillion by 2028. Mm -hmm. Now, you know how this works, right? It's the United States, let's say our cap is 100 million tons of CO2, and we produce 105 million tons. Well, let's say Bangladesh, they have a cap of 20 million tons, but they only produce 10, so they've got 10 extra uh, carbon credits. We can buy those credits from them and we're still in good shape. Now think about this. No less carbon has been produced, but a whole lot of money has changed hands. Now, where's that money supposed to go? It's supposed to go to stuff like planting trees, CO2 capture, and that kind of thing to mitigate that excess going in there. Now, that money goes to the international banks, the UN, and then to the politicians at Bangladesh and all these other countries. And I'm sure every nickel of it's going to mitigate CO2 emissions. <laughs> And if you believe that, meet me after the meeting. I've got some beachfront property down in Sand Mountain. I'll gladly sell you. Not happening, guys. $20 trillion will be invested in green energy by 2030. Guys, that kind of money, there are a lot of sharks circling. 60% of that's going to be private, but 40% of it is going to be your tax money. There's a lot of people making a lot of money. Going green might not mean exactly what you think it means. I've always been told to follow the money if you want to find out what's going on. BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street manage 90% of the equity funds on Wall Street. They're the largest shareholders in 88% of the Standard & Poor companies. And all of them say, our companies have to take steps to decarbonize. The uh, 
CEO of BlackRock, appropriately named Larry Fink. He is all in on the uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, the environment, social and governance, and the stakeholder capitalism, compliments of Mr. Paul Schwab. In fact, Fink is on the board of the World Economic Forum. Now, he says, uh, all of our companies have to decarbonize. What about the companies that can't? Steel, aviation, foundries, that can't decarbonize. Well, BlackRock will sell them carbon offsets so they can get to net zero. And you won't miss that money after all. And you get to pat yourself on the back and virtue signal what you're saving the planet. But the investors are just getting less money. But BlackRock's getting money. State Street's getting money. Who else benefits? Career politicians. All of them, local, state, federal, international leaders, Kerry, Moore, those kind of people, Klaus Schwab, the UN, they I don't know how you think about the UN. To me, the UN has always been third-rate politicians from third world countries. If they were all that clever that we should listen to them, they would have been clever enough to beat the second-rate politicians that defeated them at home and sent them to the UN to get them out of our hair. But these are the people we're supposed to listen to. <clears throat> Thomas Sowell, brilliant economist and social philosopher, said the worst kind of people to have in government are those who see it as a golden opportunity, opportunity to impose their own superior wisdom and virtue on others. And that's what we have, folks. I am sick to death of Al Gore and his ilk pointing their finger at me and telling me I'm not doing enough to save the planet. The planet does not need to be saved except from people like Al Gore and Klaus Schwab. Ron Paul said, truth is treason in the empire of lies. Folks, it breaks my heart to say this, but you live in an empire of lies. I didn't notice this happening. I did my bid. I served four years in the military, and I thought that was enough. It wasn't enough. It's never enough. In a democratic republic, there's always things trying to take it down, and I didn't pay attention. Most of us didn't pay attention. And for 50 years, they've been working at this scheme, and now they've just about got there. I'm not sure. And I'm just being blunt. I'm not sure we can stop it. But I've got two grandkids. And I wanted to retire and catch up on my reading. It looks like I've got a new hobby. This has to be stopped if my grandkids and your grandkids are going to have any chance at having a life like we had growing up. What do you do then? Well, you arm yourself with the truth. I've got a list over there of some books about climate change. Now, there's thousands of books out there. This is from the contrarian view, from the view that's, that's a bunch of bunk, okay? So I, I would recommend all of them on that list. Um, find out the truth. Read the other side too. Read the guys who the climate on Read their stuff too. And you're gonna find out. Scientifically, it is so weak, and rhetorically, it is putrid. It's just, it makes you wanna take a shower. It's awful. But once you arm yourself with the truth, challenge the climate lies. Everywhere, on the golf course, at the ball games with your kids, right? At church, somebody says something stupid about the climate, you say, no, nope, science doesn't support that. That's a lie. Now, you're going to get in arguments. You know, why don't we do that? Well, okay. We haven't done that for 50 years, and they're winning this battle big time. Challenge it everywhere. Why? Because if you challenge it enough, people are going to start saying, wait a minute. They're asking me to give up my constitutional rights and freedoms? They're asking us to stop using fossil fuels for God's sake? Start walking and riding a dang bicycle? and it's not about the climate, then what is the real agenda? That's what you want. You want people to start asking that question right there. It's not about the climate. Then what is the real agenda? Well, if you'll come back on October 24th, I'll tell you. <laughs> How about that for a lead in, huh? <laughs> I appreciate your time. Now, I uh, think Ricky you want to have questions. Anybody got any questions or comments? Yes, sir. I got one. You've got China with 1.3 billion people. You've got India with 1.5 billion people. And we're sitting here in the United States with only 340 million people. And we're supposed to be the ones saving the planet? Think about that. There, there are no caps on the Chinese or the Indians. They, they, don't, they don't go along with that crap. 3 billion people in two countries. If you look at it, if you just peel back one layer of the onion, None of it makes sense. It, it shows that it's a There's it's no a way that 340 million people can save the other. No. 
Seven and a half billion people? I saw uh, two weeks ago where China has uh, commissioned 300 new coal-fired plants. They don't give a rat's butt about this so-called climate change. No, they don't. They're not paying attention to it. They're on the way to building themselves up like we built ourselves up in the last century. And we're being handcuffed. But for uh, uh, too many darn Americans, that's a good idea. I don't understand that thinking, but I know it's wrong. And the electric vehicles? Drive them around in a microwave oven. You know, literally. <laughs> I love this. The, the electrical grid is in pretty bad shape in this country across the board, not just in California. Well, it also takes fossil fuel to charge the stupid thing. That's exactly right. All those lithium and all that uh, special metals. Cobalt and yes. nickel and Guys, if you, just, and if you just peel one, one layer of the onion back, all of this falls apart. Now it's try to figure out how to dispose of those batteries. You can't. Nope. There's no way to dispose of them, so they take the cars and they sit them in a... We've been had, guys. We. I'm not an activist. I think most people here are not activists. All right? We're busy living our lives. We just want to be left alone. Enjoy our kids or grandkids. The people who go along with this stuff, that's their whole reason for being. They spend 24-7 thinking about it and acting on it. And we've been living our lives, and they've been doing this right under our noses, and we haven't paid any attention to it. I was shocked six weeks ago when I found that my little hometown is cooperating with the World Economic Forum and that bald-headed idiot, Schwab. Are you kidding me? Well, it's kind of our fault because we've let it go because we've lived our life. We're supposed to be able to live our lives without having to worry about this kind of stuff. We're complying to anything and everything they throw in our face. We comply to it because we want to be safe. That's it. And what did, what did Franklin say about that? If you'll give up your liberty for some safety and security, you don't deserve either one. Dangerous freedom over a secure safety or something. Yeah. It's like, anyway, uh, I, I believe I can convince you, if you're not convinced already, of what the real agenda is and come back on the 24th. And I'm going to do it by looking at the thoughts and ideas of two people. One of them is Klaus Schwab. You know about him. The other one, I'd say, had more impact on our lives than any senator or congressman or president in our lifetimes. And you don't know his name. But I'm going to show you exactly what he's been responsible for. He's the one behind this whole thing about climate change. Does anybody have any questions for Paul? Are you going to tell us what to do about it? I'm sorry? Are you going to tell us what we can do about it? Come back on the 24th. I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> Time to lock and load. I'm sorry, did yeah. you say the, uh, the magician behind the curtain? Yeah. But everybody's too scared. Is it Klaus Schwab? Or is it Klaus Schwab? Klaus Schwab. What you're going to find out if you do any research at all, that people like Klaus Schwab and this guy from the UN that I'm going to talk about, and John Kerry, and, and all, they inbreed. I mean, they inbreed. They're all uh, they're affiliated with the Club of Rome. Mm -hmm. You know about the Club of Rome? All of these guys, Klaus Schwab, this guy from the UN, they're all members of the Club. It, the more I look at it, the more frightening it becomes. And I don't want to be too doggone dramatic about it, but guys, this has been going on for over 50 years. They're well down the road to in implementing their idea of global government. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I fell for the whole global warming thing, mm -hmm. and I kind of woke up maybe three, four years ago. You know, once the little Greta girl came out, I knew that that was it. Once they pulled her out of their bag of tricks, I said, yeah, it really doesn't make any sense. But my question to you is, uh, where did you, when you said, God, I gotta do something about this, or I gotta look into it, where did you start? Because everything, and pardon my language, is all bullshit on the internet. So where did you start to say, I gotta find a way in that's gonna enlighten like Well, that, that list over there of books, there are scientists out there. One of those books was written by the co-founder of Greenpeace, Dr. Patrick Moore. The co-founder of Greenpeace, he wrote a, a, a book condemning this climate change nonsense. Yes, he did. He said after 15 years, he had to quit Greenpeace because the ideologues took it over. He was the only one with any science training, all the rest of them. You know what they wanted to do when he quit? They wanted to ban chlorine. Chlorine that they put in the water supply and the swim pools, the single biggest health benefit to America in the 20th century. They wanted to ban it. He said, that's enough of you idiots. I'm out of here. But it's guys like that who are willing and courageous enough to stand up and say, no, I'm not going with this. And all those books are people like that. But how did you find those books? A lot of search. A lot of searching. And, and one of them will reference another one. One of them will reference another one. 
But it, the truth is out there, even on the internet, if you just read enough, but my God, you're talking about going through 12, 15, 18, 20 pages of references and finally find something that contradicts the 97% thing. It takes some time to do it. I'm retired, so I have the time to do it. So that may answer your question. I will let you know, I will, I'm actually going ahead and I will post that on the website. Uh, but there are some handouts over here that uh, Paul graciously copied I'll take a picture of this, but uh, there's some interesting uh, books around to do this. Um, if there are no more questions, I would like to give oh, yeah, a limit. Rick, the last word, you did some more research on some of the plants that you've been investigating. Yeah, I don't know if everybody's heard about... Hello, hello. I don't know if everybody's heard about uh, this uh, Chattanooga Housing Action Plan. This was just passed last month. Uh, it's over 100 pages. Uh, before that, it was the Chattanooga Climate Action Plan, and in between this and the Housing Action Plan was an education plan, and when you back up, then there's the one Chattanooga plan, and this came out in 22. Kelly came into office in 21. This is his map for the future, the way he sees it, and he's got uh, 40 principles and seven goals in here. and. The, the idea is that each of these plans fulfills part of the goals. Like in here, they're talking about soft density. They want to change the single family residence to soft density. Uh, I moved from California. They declared uh, single family residence. That concept was racist. So they were adding in uh, four and eight plexes into our neighborhoods. Buy a house, tear it down, and then they could build with uh, no parking if they were in within half an hour, half of a mile of a uh, bus route. So they're increasing the density was their whole idea. They, and so here I'm still looking in, there's a lot of information in this, but they talk about so, soft density and public subsidies. So they're looking at us paying money to subsidize lower income housing in our neighborhoods from what I can see. Kelly put 33 million bucks into, in 2022, into paying for housing um, and they're looking at they want to so they want to commit to a certain amount of funding every year they're telling all these companies and agencies to ramp up so it's not just the climate action plan it's really the one chattanooga plan with the climate action plan the housing plan the education plan it's like this is the umbrella so we're not really we find out we're not really battling just the climate action plan. Uh, before Kelly came into office, they had a Chattanooga Smart City Plan. And then part of the Chattanooga Climate Action Plan, before that was the Green Spaces Plan. Uh, Chattanooga Integrated Communicated Community Sustainability Plan. So these, a lot of this has been in the works for a long time. Um, if anybody, you know, I encourage you to read the, the, chat, the, the one Chattanooga, like here's one of his clauses or, or systems, okay, the one Chattanooga plan is systems focused. The gaps in both opportunities and outcomes remain stubbornly broad in Chattanooga, driven by decades of poor policy choices, disinvestment in the black community, and our failure to address the structural legacy of white supremacy. We understand that to address these challenges, we need to change the systems that perpetuate these inequities, not simply apply the bandages of quick superficial solutions. So this is the, this whole thing about equity is driving so much of this. So it's, uh, there's a lot to investigate is what I'm getting at. It's, it's not just the climate action plan, which is really what opened my eyes originally. It's, it starts to be, everything you know it all comes together so
Any questions? So, Rick, are you saying that all of this really comes down to this social equity is what's behind all of this division? All of this? Uh, that's that's right. one of the components. It's uh, like in the climate action plan, the the very first goal is Chattanooga will reduce disparities among socially and economically vulnerable communities. What does that have to do with climate? Yeah, but that's in everything. It's woven into everything. So. Well, just like socialism to me. Yeah. All these plans. Yeah, and question, back here. Question. Oh. Simple question. Has anybody got a response from the mayor's office? If you if you have written the mayor's office about this issue that he's pushing, I can't get any response. You won't. It's it been paid off. Yeah. The WBF has already paid over five million dollars on Chattanooga. And they have this big pocket. Yeah. Who, who did you contact in the mayor's office? I wrote a letter. To you. We wrote a letter. Yes. Okay. And that's why like even his secretary won't even respond. They won't. I should get your information after the meeting. Yes, because we need to talk. Also, I have his uh, cell phone. He voted on it. That's right. He was the only one that voted for it. So he got the money. So why, I have, would, he, why would he answer you? That's right. I have his personal cell phone number on the website. <laughs> 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 I don't think it's changed it yet. <laughs> um, so as you can see, and we've got a very uh, small crowd here today, but again, this is, our, this is only our third meeting. Uh, we're trying to see what is of interest to you. And I know most people's interest is what can I do? Where can I help? I know I'm upset, I got grandkids, I don't want them to grow up in this environment. I want them to know the liberties that I had. And you can hear from my, uh, from my accent, I am not from here, I'm originally from Austria. And I fled Austria, and I thought the United States was the best country in the world because it offered me opportunities that I knew I did not have in Vienna. And I did make something out of myself when I moved here. And then when I moved into California, I thought, I've arrived in paradise until Newsom was reelected. And that whole state really should be, it is so left-leaning, it should really just fall into the ocean as far as I'm concerned. So anyway, um, we would like, please help us be a volunteer, sign the pledge now. It's not holding you to anything, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a pledge that when the time comes to start collecting, you can go to your church group and say, listen guys, we gotta do something here, sign this. Once we have the wording for what it is we want to put on the referendum, what we want to have uh, put on the November uh, 2024 uh, ballot, it's got to be really precise and it's got to be laser focused, but we need to figure out exactly what is it we're asking. Are we asking for them to remove the cameras that are sprouting out everywhere and are all through downtown, a hundred of them? Do we really need a hundred cameras that go all the way down Martin Luther King Boulevard? Do we really need uh, license plate readers? Why do we need license plate readers on all these cameras? Um, yeah, it's public safety, I know, but uh, a license plate reader has never stopped a crime. Um, what, what, what do we want them to take away? What do we want to stop? And that's something that we all need to be educated about in trying to figure out um, what, what, what bothers me most about this. And we really, we're really not going, there are other groups out there that, uh, like Mothers, Moms for Liberty, uh, they're, they're dealing with the school system, there is a Second Amendment uh, groups out there. But we want to, we, we don't want Chattanooga to be transformed from the scenic city into a surveillance city. And I, like, I would like to uh, thank Harold for crystallizing that for us because that's really what's happening here and that is what we need to stop. So we're not ready to put anything down on the referendum yet. Uh, we're, we're working on that and we need to crystallize it. Please do come back on the 10th of October because that is your opportunity. 
not to hear me talking, I mean I like talking, but uh, that is your opportunity to speak out and say, this is what's really important, and this is what I'm going to do about it. And that's the words that I'd like to leave you with. And uh, Paul, thank you so much. I this, this was very, I mean, it was very educational. It was well laid out. And I certainly hope you guys come back on the 10th and then you hear Paul on the 24th. Ah, one more. What do you pay for the room? Rick? 100 for two hours. So we, uh, the, the, uh, the donations that we got last time paid for the room last time and also paid for the cards that I showed you. Um, and, you know, we're, a, a lot of the money that uh, the websites co cost money, the, the, the marketing costs money. It's, uh, we've pretty, yeah, we've pretty much self-funded at this point and we're, you know, we are taking donations. <laughs> but thank you for asking. Yeah. The referendum that you're leading up to for November of 2024. Yes. Is it a binding referendum? Rick, you have more information about that. Yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, I looked into all that. Um, let's see. The, um, the way it works, I talked to the Hamilton County Election Commission, and the way it works is that um, we, we come up with a petition a uh, referendum and then uh, we we put it together and it goes to the election commission they have 30 days to review it and then they give it back to us for 15 days to fix any problems with it then it goes back to them and then they have 15 days to approve it so that basically that's two months right there and then it would go okay then we go out and we collect almost 9,000 signatures and we have 75 days. The, that's the idea of the pledges, is that we're developing a list, so by March approximately when we would start, it'd be great to have 6,000 signatures, or pledges already, and then we could, we'll, uh, we'd be able to contact everybody and have a pledge or a petition signing, because we'd know, we'd say, oh, at Hickson, we're going to be at this restaurant for two hours, and people could come and sign. We'd have signing events. Um, we'd have 75 days. We'd vet the signatures as we go because we can get a, uh, a list of all the registered Chattanooga voters from the County uh, Election Commission. We can make sure that all those are valid. We turn it in and then if we qualify, we hit that mark, then it goes to city, uh, the uh, attorney for, the, uh, for Chattanooga. And then they, uh, it, then it would go before the city council. And the city council then vote on it. And if they vote yes, then that is in place then. And if they vote no, then it automatically goes to the ballot. And then we would start our campaigning for the November 24. And that's the, tr the tricky part is there's an election in March, there's one in August, and there's one in November. We really, to get more time and educate people, we need it in November. So we don't want to do it too soon because we, we, it could end up in August. And the biggest turnout is going to be in November for the presidential election. But, but the, the nice thing is, is that then once it becomes an ordinance, the city council can't just then meet and there's nine of them and do the same thing again and say, well, we don't like that. We're going to vote five to two and all your uh, effort was wasted. They can't do that because we're the people. We pass this at the ballot box and they can't override it with the five to two vote. So, but, so this is the only thing that we've come up with that, that has any teeth. It's not like the feel good signatures where we collected 15,000 signatures on some website online. We go to city council and they go, oh, that's great but they're not going to do anything. This will force them to take a vote on it, and if they don't do it, it will be forced then to go onto the ballot. So. Um, you said that you would probably have to do a Is 
that, I'm just saying, like, what type of demographic are, I mean, we're one of the type of people who would vote in the, you know, maybe the, the uh, elections that, you know, that are lesser. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. It's like a strategy. Like, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Maybe a smaller election. Like, the type of people that would vote that are going to go and be responsible and vote in voters that we, that we want. I, I don't know. I'm just going out there. You got to, it's, 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 I guess you're thinking about what's America feeling and what's, what's Hampton County feeling. 